Hello, and welcome to Ancient Words Speak Today. I'm Pastor Nathan Krauss, and I invite you to join me as together we look into the pages of Scripture to discover how the Bible is still relevant to our lives and how these ancient words really do speak today. I can tell you the date. I can tell you the year. It was sometime early in 1986, a few months into the year. At the end of 1985, I had become a Christian. And I was 22 years old, and I felt impressed that I needed to do something now as a new Christian. The impression was growing. It didn't happen right away, but several months into my walk with Jesus, I felt like I've got to make a change. And so I remember very clearly that evening when I knelt down on the floor in my bedroom with a stack of albums before me. You remember those, some of you. But uh, I had invested quite a bit in rock and roll albums. And many of them actually were pressed on virgin vinyl. If any of you know what that is, you audio files from back in the 70s. And they were quite expensive, it's supposed to sound better, I'm not sure they did. But I invested quite a bit in this collection of music. And there I was, kneeling before them in prayer and saying, Lord, I renounce the music and the lifestyle that I've lived associated with that music. I recognize, Lord Jesus, that it's not appropriate for me to keep these albums if I'm going to walk closely with you in complete and full surrender. And so one by one, I took each album out of its sleeve, broke it, and tossed it aside. A couple thousand dollars worth of albums, I'm sure. Why would I do such a foolish thing? Well, that was the question my brothers asked. What is wrong with you? Why didn't you sell it to us? And you could have given the money to the church. I said, yes, that's true. I could have. But for me, it was important to make that statement. I was making a clear statement for myself, but also I sensed that I was making a statement before the universe. Because now I was consciously aware of an unseen battle that is raging on this planet. And I knew that by doing such, I was making a statement before all the players in the battle, that I renounce this because of what it stands for. And I will not sell it and give the money to the church because I think it's important enough that I make this clear display. We're going to read a story here. Thank you, Rex, for reading the scripture. Um, we're going to encounter in our passage today as we continue in our study of the book of Acts that a similar thing happened, to a much greater degree, of course, in the, the principal city of Ephesus. We'll talk about why that's significant in Ephesus itself and what was going on as we study God's word together. But before we do that, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, but we would not come to it without asking you to bless us in our study of it. We ask for your Holy Spirit, the original inspiration of these words, to be present now with us and give us understanding as we read and consider them together. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. We're continuing in our study of the book of Acts, and I'm going to invite you to pick it up in verse 19. If you haven't been with us in the past, we hope you'll be able to just jump into, walk through the word here. We noticed that Paul was at Ephesus. He had wanted to go for some time. Ephesus was a principal city. It was actually the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, but probably one of the most critically important. It was the most populous city with a quarter million people in the most uh, prominent province of Rome, of the Roman Empire. That would be Asia southwestern Turkey, what was called Asia as a province then. And this territory, this area, was very wealthy and affluent. Ephesus was a natural harbor. 
thereby bringing much trade and uh, industry to its city. Because of that, it had wide-reaching influence throughout the Roman Empire, but especially throughout Asia, that province. And that's why Paul was so eager to go. Take a look, then, at verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. I'm reading from James Version today. Uh, God was the one who was working, you notice. It wasn't Paul. He was working through the hands of Paul. Paul had spent more time in Ephesus, by the way, than any other city in all of his missionary efforts. He was there for about three years. He saw the great opportunity, the impact that could be made in the Roman Empire through ministry in this space, in this particular place. And there he was working for the Lord. And it says that God did unusual miracles. Actually, two words in Greek. It says, not ordinary. So perhaps instead of unusual, if you think of an English word that says that means not ordinary, what might you say? Extraordinary would be a very good translation there. He was doing extraordinary miracles through the hands of Paul. Paul's hands were not the source of the miracles. But because this man was committed to Jesus Christ and his work and his kingdom being advanced here on earth, incredible things were happening through his hands. God is looking for people like Paul today. That unusual or extraordinary things might be done through our hands because God is the source of the power behind them. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs, these would be, sorry to be so blunt, but literally they were his sweat rags while he worked as a leather worker, a tent maker. The handkerchiefs he would use while working, even the handkerchiefs or aprons, literally the word is belt, so it would mean anything attached to his body, maybe a, a cloth here at the belt to wipe his hands during his work. Handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And that word literally is not body, but skin. In other words, what is being communicated here is that these were items who were, which were in contact with Paul's skin. That's significant, and we'll talk about why. Those things that were brought to the sick, and then the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Sounds like magic, doesn't it? Well, Ephesus was known for its belief in magic and its many magical spells and incantations. As a matter of fact, in the ancient world, Ephesus had something called the Ephesus letters. They were referred to all out throughout the ancient world as the Ephesus letters. They were magical formulas, incantations, and spells. Ephesus was this incredible place which had a magical allure about it. By the way, I, thought, I didn't mention earlier that Ephesus housed the temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it had these wealthy homes. That they, haven't even be, they haven't been able to finish nearly any of the excavation in the Jewish section of the town yet. But uh, they're still working year by year on excavations in Ephesus. They have found these homes that are three stories high with a courtyard in the center and colonnades reaching to the third floor. These are wealthy people, but they're deeply steeped in superstitious belief. And so in their superstitious belief, some of these people who were interested in Paul's message but perhaps not fully converted Christians must have believed there was some kind of magic in those items that were touching his body because that was what they believed in their other magical superstitious practices. And they thought of Paul perhaps as the greatest magician that had come along. Paul was able to do these incredible miracles through his hands. God was actually doing them. But they looked at Paul, and they probably thought of him as a, an extraordinary magician, unlike any kind they've ever seen before. And following their superstitious practices from the past, what they do is they kind of adopt this Christian message, but they still practice magic in that they take, please, 
Understand, the text doesn't say Paul was sending these handkerchiefs and aprons out. But people would take them and deliver them to people that they loved or cared about who were ill or possessed by demons. When my mother was sick with cancer, there were Christian friends that had come along. I didn't know them, but through a mutual friend, my mother had contact with these born-again Christians who believed that the way that she would be healed of her cancer is they would send her cloths that had been prayed over by the church. And then they said, pin this to your body, May, and you're going to get well. Kind of a magical, superstitious belief still in the church today, in some churches. Now, I'm not meaning to lessen my faith in God healing. through The idea was that there was some kind of a magical power in these claws because they had been prayed over. Just attach it to your body and you'll be well. Of course, if I knew then what I know now, I would have made some changes to my mother's lifestyle, and I'm sure she could have recovered as she cooperated with the Creator and His health laws, and that would be her best chance of being restored to health. But as it goes, even today there are churches which practice such a thing because of this very passage. But the passage is not based on solid theology, it's based on superstition in Ephesus. They were doing it, but Interestingly enough, even though Paul didn't initiate the practice, God honored their faith. These people didn't have a full understanding, but somehow God wanted them to understand that the Jesus whom Paul is preaching is powerful enough to heal and cast out evil. And so, he chooses to honor their faith in the way that they applied it. These very things that were pinned to the body taken and put in contact with the bodies, were, they were successful in their attempts to do what they said they would do. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. We'll, we'll pause there for a moment in the middle of the verse. These were roaming, strolling, literally is what the word says, Jewish exorcist. An exorcist is somebody who adjures. The, the Greek word there is exorcizo. Ek, exorcizo. And this word, well, it was made popular by a movie many years ago, but it doesn't specifically mean casting out demons. It means adjuring or declaring with power and authority. It's actually the same word if you look at Matthew 26, 63. You notice that Jesus in his trial before the chief priest Caiaphas he was quiet, right? He was silent. He opened not his mouth, the word says. But you read in the next verse, and the, the chief priest did what? The high priest said, I adjure you by the name of the living God that you answer me. Are you the son of the living God? Are you the Messiah, the one to be sent? And what happens? Jesus answers. The word there that the high priest used, I adjure you, is the very same word in Sorkizo. An exorcism is a demand, an adjournment for an answer. And so these exorcists were ones who would use the power of words to supposedly control evil spirits. Notice that it said they had taken it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus, literally to name the name. Because in their magic formulas, there were often lists of names which were said, if you can name the right name of that demon, you have control over them. Or if you can call a spirit which is stronger than that one, you have control over him. And so they had these long and they would sell them and they would be very expensive. If you wanted to have the magic formula or the secret names, you had to pay for it. Now if they had this practice of already naming names to try to affect their their ministry of exorcism, why not just add Jesus to it if you're superstitious, right? I remember being in India in the summer of 93 and sitting in a motor rickshaw. And as I looked ahead, I saw a picture of a decal. It was common for the rickshaw drivers to place decal stickers on the inside of their rickshaws. And there was a decal of Jesus before me in the front of the rickshaw. I thought, huh, that's cool. This guy's a Christian. 
And I was about to start talking to him, about to talk to him about Jesus, and I looked to my left, and there was Ganpat, and to my right was Shiva. You know, if you believe in millions of Hindu gods, why not add one more to the mix and just make sure your bases are covered, right? Put Jesus up there. Well, that's what these Jewish exorcists were doing, traveling around and just calling the name of Jesus. Not calling on the name of Jesus, but literally it says naming the name of Jesus as if there were some power in the name and they could use it for their own desires. You see, they were making a living at this. They were getting wealthy. As a matter of fact, you might think, well, the Jews were very strict about worshiping God properly. Just like in the Christian world today, you have Christians who are driven by profit or fame. In those days, in, ancient, in the ancient world, there were a lot of Jews who were involved in magic. The texts that have been discovered and preserved through the years of Jewish magicians are quite prominent. There are quite a few of them. So people often believe because the Jews claimed that they had a connection to the supreme God that they would be the best magicians. And others saw opportunity then. I can be a Jewish exorcist and get paid quite a bit of money for my work. Just like today you might say, you know, this superstitious stuff sounds strange, but if you're like me, and I don't mean to offend anybody, much of what happens in today's Christian healing ministries that you might witness even on TV seems superstitious and phony to me. And in reality, many of those uh, healing ministers have been exposed for what they are. One of them, the story was told of how he would send teams, if he's coming to town and people would sign up for the evangelistic crusade or the healing crusade and they'd say, we're going to be a part of this, well, they would send teams out to visit those that were planning to attend. And once they get into the home, they'd ask a lot of questions. And they'd notice pictures on the wall of family members and so forth. And they would take good notes, and then they would put those notes with the name. And the, the evangelist who's doing the healing on stage has an earplug here, and he's listening to what's being read on the notes from someone backstage. And he says, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing... I'm getting an impression that you have three children in your family, two daughters and a son, and they're like, wow, I never told him that. How does he know? And one of them is struggling with an illness. Yes, it's true, and I think it's cancer. Yes, how does he know all that? Well, because his team had been to your home a month before you showed up here. This has been exposed. It's wrong and it's rotten to take the name of Jesus and use it for your own glory fame, and wealth. But that's exactly what these people were trying to do, these Jewish exorcists in Ephesus in Paul's day. And we see that while God allowed healing to take place with the handkerchiefs and the aprons, even like he did in Acts 5, you read about Peter, his shadow passing over ill people and they would become well. There was nothing magical about his shadow, although superstition said that the shadow of a magician or a holy person could have an impact or an effect. God wasn't trying to affirm that belief. What he was trying to do was point people to Peter because the God of Peter is the one who brought healing, right? And in this instance, he's trying to point them to Paul. It's not the magic in the handkerchiefs, these sweat rags, or these dirty aprons, work cloths. There's no magic in that, but what he's trying to do through the healings is to point to Paul because Paul has a message about where true healing comes from. Let's continue here. We're in Act 19, in the middle of verse 13, these itinerant Jewish exorcists were taking it upon themselves to name the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we adjure you, there's that same word, it mean, we exorhizo, we exercise you, same word that was used by Caiaphas when he demanded that Jesus would answer. By the name, I'm sorry, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So they added Jesus into their formula. Paul was quite aware, of course, of what was going on with the magicians in Ephesus. The belief that there was some power through Jewish magic was so extensive that 
they'd even come up with these, you know, the supposed writings, the Testament of Solomon, because people believed that even King Solomon, it was through his wisdom and his wise sayings that he had power over evil. As a matter of fact, the legend is that Solomon had the temple of his time built by making evil spirits work for him. You think it sounds crazy? I would agree with you, but it's that kind of a tradition that continued right on through to Kabbalistic Judaism today. You've heard of Kabbalah, Madonna, the thing she's into, and some other famous personalities? It all stems right back to that, this magical, mystical mix of religion and magic. Paul was aware of that. Look at Ephesians 1.21, because later he would write a letter to the Ephesians. You know, he's with them now in Ephesus. But later when he writes to them, notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21. He's speaking about Jesus prior to this, being seated at the right hand in heavenly places. It says, far above all principality and power. Obviously a spiritual war is going on, and he's referencing that. And might and dominion. And every name that is named. Because in Ephesus, that's what they did. They named names to try to control spirits. Not only in this age, but also in the one which is to come. And then look over at Ephesians 6 and verse 12, talking about the spiritual battle and the heavenly armor we need. Paul's addressing this to the Ephesians who were quite acquainted with that spiritual battle. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, I hope you're not too uncomfortable with the content of the message today. We're just walking through Acts. We happen to be here. But perhaps it's appropriate for us to be reminded as we've come to this passage that we have been born on a battle zone born on a battlefield. It's real. And though we may not like to talk about it, the scripture does talk about it. And sticking your head in the sand doesn't make it go away. You cannot see the radio waves in this room, but if I tuned on a radio, you'd hear the, you'd know they were real. Or the cell phones that work. You don't see that stuff. You can't even see the air that you're breathing, but you know it's real because you're filling your lungs with it. You can go ahead and take a deep breath now that I mentioned it. But just because something's not seen doesn't make it not real. And in the unseen realm, we understand that a battle is raging. Paul was addressing it here. Verse 14. It mentions that some of these Jewish exorcists were doing this, and then it's going to tell us specifically about seven sons that, of Siva. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, probably self-proclaimed, by the way. There's no uh, record of him being acknowledged anywhere in Jerusalem. But he proclaims himself as a chief priest because that would make him more powerful, because he would then know and have connection with the supreme God. These seven sons of Siva we're doing so. Verse 15, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. My Bible says no, it's actually two different Greek words. First one is to know like in a relationship, the second one is to be aware of, have understanding about. So the demon responds, I know Jesus, and I know about Paul, I know of him, because he's connected to Jesus, we can assume. But he answers, with this question, but who are you? Who are you? Think about the implications of that question. The unseen battle that rages, rages around you and even in your life. And the question, who are you, indicates in this case, they weren't familiar to the Spirit because they didn't know Jesus. You see, the power is in the relationship, not in the name. It's not a magical formula or an incantation. It's the power in the relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Well, listen to what happened. Verse 16, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And when you read the words naked and, wo naked and wounded, you may, like me, your mind may go to the two demoniacs, the Gergesenes by the Sea of Galilee. That's the picture that we have when evil spirits take control. And they drove those men out of that home in embarrassment, shame, and humiliation. But I want you to note that one word near the middle of verse 16, that they prevailed against them. And that word, same word that's in the Greek, it's actually the same word also, it's used in Revelation chapter 12, because it's actually giving us the history of this battle which Paul is addressing in Ephesus, the spiritual warfare. Revelation 12, beginning at verse 7, and war broke out in heaven of all the places, right? We think we associate heaven with peace, but war broke out in heaven because of the rebellion of, a, of a, an angel who turned against God. War broke out in heaven. Michael, that's what Jesus is called before his incarnation, before he came to earth as a baby. Michael in Hebrew means who is like God. It can be a question or a statement, the one who is like God. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. There's that word. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Skip down a little further and look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. The heavens are rejoicing because the war is over there. But it goes on to say, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. He did not prevail in heaven. He was kicked out. He came here. And now we see that in this particular battle, in Ephesus with these Jewish exorcists who think they can call on the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches like some kind of magical incantation that will have power over them. It says they prevailed over these guys. It, em it emphasizes in our minds the reality of the spiritual war which is going on. You may not see it around you. You read your Bible and you hear about spiritual thing, war and you hear about demon possession and you think that's so foreign to me. Do not make the mistake of thinking it's not real. I would venture to say that very few of us have actually seen or touched a leper. I have several because of places I've traveled. And it made it more real to me. But the Bible speaks about leprosy because you have not seen it or come in contact with one doesn't mean it's not real. In the same way, in this case, this is a real thing which happened. It was a real problem, especially in the ancient world, and it continues to be still in some parts of the world. I graduated with a friend from college who was from Haiti. He went back to Haiti and pastored 27 churches. I'm thankful that I don't pastor in Haiti. But... Uh, his elders were doing all the work. He was just traveling around. But one of the things he constantly dealt with was this very kind of a spiritual battle. It is real, though it may not be something we experience directly in our world or in our particular little circle. Okay, back to Ephesus. I'm sorry, back to Acts, where Paul is in Ephesus. They left the home wounded. God made a very clear distinct... May have thought magic in the handkerchiefs and the aprons. He was trying to point them to the Jesus whom Paul preaches, but he also made it very clear it's not some kind of a name that you can take for granted and use lightly. It made it clear that the simple, humble leather worker was more effective in this ministry of exorcism of evil spirits than were the supposed professionals. Because God's name cannot be yanked around and used like a rabbit's foot lucky charm. 
Read on with me, verse 17. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. They realized how important this was, and, and if even the professionals couldn't be protected from these evil spirits, fear would fall on you. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. But Paul, that simple leather worker who's pre preaching Jesus, his Jesus is the most powerful, and his name is magnified, and that's exactly what God wanted to happen, for Jesus to be magnified in Ephesus. Read on with me in verse 18. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. They were believers. They listened to Paul's message, but they hadn't completely made the transition. They were still mixed up in their magical, superstitious world. Kind of like me coming to Jesus as a Christian, but still listening to that music that was so against everything it stood for. And I realized I've got to make this change. Do you also know that for the first six months of my walk with Jesus, and as a member of the church, I continued to also engage in my activities and meetings in a New Age cult, which I had been involved with for three years. I continued for six months doing both because I didn't see the incongruity of it. I didn't think they were incompatible. I didn't think I was in a cult. I was just in this great movement, and everybody should know about it. And I would try to bring my friends from church into it. And I tried to bring my friends from the cult into church. I just thought we could all be in harmony in one big happy family. God made it very clear to me, thankfully. It took six months to get through this thick skull, but he made it clear through a friend that I'm thankful he sent to me. He made it clear that the two were not compatible. As a matter of fact, John and I uh, he used to be a student in my karate school, and I, I was telling him about Jesus, and he was interested, and we walked into a Christian bookstore in Allentown, Pennsylvania together, and right, and he had been bugging me to get out of this thing. He thought it was you know, best. And as we walked in the door, there was a book on cults, you know, and it listed all the typical ones you might expect. And I laughed at it. I said, hey, John, check it out. Maybe this is in there, because I didn't believe it would be. And he'd been bugging me to get out. I said, pick it. So he picks it up and he looks at it and it's listed. He bought the book and I thought, oh boy, he's going to try to use this against me. And now he's got more ammunition. We walked out of the store and he handed the book to me. He said, I bought this for you. So I read the chapter on Est. And God made it very clear to me that I cannot be a Christian and continue in that lifestyle as well. So these believers in Ephesus apparently. They've accepted the preaching of Paul. They believe that Jesus is the powerful God that he said, but they haven't completely made a break with their old lifestyle. They're still doing some things that they shouldn't be doing. Maybe somebody here can relate to that today. I don't know. But you come to Jesus, and you don't make a clean break with that which you know you need to leave behind when you come to Jesus. That's the place that these guys were in, and these ladies. Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Actually, that, that phrase in Greek could also mean, it was translated, divulging spells. Telling their deeds, divulging spells. You know what that means? Revealing the secret spells that were used to attract someone of the opposite emphasis, or attract wealth, or place a curse over an enemy, or any of the other things that they did, did bring protection or prosperity work, like your little amulet saint on the dashboard of your car or swinging from the mirror, whatever people do today. It was that kind of a thing, and they realized we've got to make a clean break from that, and they confessed, but they divulged the spells, which actually meant that they rendered them powerless, because these were secrets that only certain people were supposed to know who paid for the secret. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together, literally scrolls, brought them together and burned them in the sight of all, which was a way of saying I renounce something. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver, literally five, 10,000, a myriad is 10,000. So it adds up to 50,000 pieces of silver. How much is that? Well, one drachma, one piece of silver, would be the average 
laborer's work day. So let's say today, let's say that a, a laborer today, just for simplicity's sake, we'll say maybe they earn about $12 an hour, good hard labor, that's low. And an eight hour day, that's $96. Or maybe they're working for $10 an hour and a long hour day, let's say it's a hundred, roughly $100 per day. Well, 50,000 times 100 equals what? You mathematicians? 5 million. So this would be the equivalent of about $5 million today. It would be 150 men working for an entire year and pooling all their income together. Stack it up. Now, the next time you have a bonfire, I'd like you to consider burning $5 million in that bonfire. This is no small thing. This was an, I mean, for me to burn a thousand or two thousand dollars worth of albums, whatever it was, I mean, to break it up and toss it away to make my statement, that's nothing compared to what was happening here. An entire city, a community of believers in the city were saying, we realize that we've been playing around with Jesus, but we haven't made a complete commitment to him. We've seen by the events that God orchestrated in our city that we cannot continue to do that. We don't take the name of Jesus lightly anymore. That there's a spiritual war going on. We're in the thick of it, and I'm ready to get serious about who I'm, which side I'm on. I am drawing battle lines. And they made that conscious decision, brought these wealthy items. They could have sold them, you know, and given the money to the fledgling church that was just beginning to be birthed in Ephesus. Wouldn't that have made more sense? No, they had to make it clear, we renounce that lifestyle, we are done with it, and we have no confidence in it. And as a matter of fact, we want to do war against it. And so they bring these things together, and they have a giant bonfire out in the open square. The battle is real. And the battle was raging right there in Ephesus about 2,000 years ago. And God called his people to make a clear choice. He counted up the value of them and it totaled, totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. There's that same word again. You know, the battle's going on and somebody's going to prevail in this battle. And in the end, God prevails in the war. I love that story in the book of Revelation. You know, um, some seminary students were saying, you know, I don't know how we can understand this book. We're going to class, and they're shooting hoops in the, in the uh, gym after class one evening. And as they're shooting hoops, they're talking, saying, I don't get it. They're all in the same class together on the book of Revelation. Our professor seems to understand it, but I don't think I could ever understand the book of Revelation. And they're, as they're doing that, the janitor's walking by, and he says, I understand it. Hey, we're working on our MDivs here, buddy. Here's the janitor. What do you mean you understand? We, we know Greek and Hebrew and we've studied theology and we're, we're in these lectures from the brightest uh, professor in the seminary on the book of Revelation and we don't understand it. How do you think it is that you understand it? Tell us then if you think you know. Tell us about the book of Revelation. He says it's simple. God wins. <laughs> so if you don't understand anything else about the book of Revelation, please understand that in this spiritual battle, God wins. Now, Battle lines are being drawn up. Do you want to be a winner or a loser? You want to be on the win? I mean, if you know which side wins, why not join the winning team? I loved it when we were in Fiji. My wife and I went to Fiji in 98 and 99 mission trips that I, I led groups over there. We did some fantastic things. It was wonderful. And you know, Fiji, the mo they have the reputation of being the friendliest people on earth. I think they work extra hard to give that that impression because their history is that they were headhunters and cannibals. But they really are a friend. But they taught us a song while we were over there. You know what it was? Jesus is the winner man, the winner man, the winner man. My kids and I sing it sometimes at home. And it goes on to say, Satan is the loser man. To lose a man, to lose a man. I don't want to be no loser man. I want to be a winner man, a winner man. 
I win a man all the time. You know who's the winner and you know who's the loser in this spiritual war. Get serious. Get on the right side. You can't be playing around on the battlefield. And just like those Ephesian believers got serious and said, it's time to renounce everything that isn't completely for Jesus in this battle. If there's anything where we've messed around, we haven't let go of something we need to let go of, it's time because the battle is raging. The devil knows, the Bible says, that his time is short, right? And he comes down with great wrath. We read it in Revelation 12. Now, I could tell you stories related to this, but given the audience we have today, I won't do it. Personal experiences and personal stories of friends of mine who've been on the front lines of this battle. And it's not... It's not imaginary at all. It's very real. But I don't think you need to hear those stories in order to be convinced that we need to wholeheartedly give ourselves to Jesus Christ every moment of every day. So I want to invite you to do that. You know, many times I'll share a message, wrap it up, and as I'm shaking your hands on the way out, people say to me, Pastor, I was moved today. I was ready to jump up out of my seat if you had just made the call. But you never make the call. Okay, I'm not big into altar calls. I don't want to twist people's arms, but I would like to invite you right now to make a decision to throw yourself completely on the side of Jesus Christ in this spiritual battle. And for some of us, that might mean changing a few things in our lives. It might mean changing what we're watching on TV or where we're going on the internet, or what we're listening to in the music, or the games we play on the computer, or the associations we've been keeping. I don't know, but I'm sure that by now the Holy Spirit's impressing your mind. There's something maybe that needs to change in your life. And I just want to invite you to take a stand for Jesus today. I'm not asking you to stand up. I'm asking you to take a stand by making a decision, right here, right now. God knows what's going on in your heart and in your mind. Don't wait for another opportunity. Follow the example of the Ephesians and burn the books that are standing between you and Jesus.